and gentlemen, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Are you in good form? Yes, yes, it's great to have you here. Yes, I do do my own announcements. <laughs> It's a massive operation I'm running here, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see. really is huge. And yes, especially for tonight, we have brought out a large polka dot bright light sheet just to flush out any latent epileptics in the room. <laughs> we'll talk to the people in the audience. Hello, how are you? We're clearly talking to you fuckers at the front. Good to have you here, good to have you here, good to have you here, good to have you here. You have to do that. It defines the gig, ladies and gentlemen. Some of the ones on the tour this year already have been slightly bizarre. Uh, it was in Derry, right? Fantastic part of the world. There was a guy in the front row looking very imposing. I said, hey, what's your name? And your man goes, it's Paddy. I said, really? Is it Paddy? And what do you do, Paddy? I'm a priest. <laughs> now, the thing is, I've said this before, right? I'm not a religious man, right? I don't even believe in God, but still Catholic, obviously. <laughs> and you can't not keep going, ha, ah, Father, is that all right? Are you enjoying it so far? How's that? Good man yourself. And go back. Because there's a place called St. Columns Hall in Derry as well, which is like an old temperance hall. And now, once I said, Jesus, Father, I hope you don't mind what I'm doing with the hall. And he says, don't worry, I'll exorcise it later. Which I thought was sweet from, but he said it in a really dense dairy accent, which means what he actually says was, Don't worry, I ain't exercising glitter. <laughs> and I said, What? You exercise in glitter? <laughs> and the priest goes, No, I exercise in glitter. And I went, Yeah, you exercise. And I couldn't get the image out of my head of the priest just sprinkling himself and then stretching. And then just, and the light dancing off the calves as it went through all the things. It was a wonderful thing. It's fantastic. So that's the second level we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. We're looking for ridiculous things. When I eventually randomly pick you, how are you, sir, at the end of the row? What's your name, champ? Dan. Dan, how are you, Dan? Are you local? I am, yeah, London. You're a Londoner. Like what part of London? Vo Vauxhall. North of Vauxhall? Vauxhall. Oh, Vauxhall. Sorry, north of Vauxhall is the river, isn't it? For fuck's sake. <laughs> A ridiculous answer, Dan. But you never give that answer. You give a perfectly reasonable answer, and there we are mocking you for what I misheard. Oh, it's cruel, Dan, isn't it? It's vicious. And what do you do, Dan, in Vauxhall? I'm a technician. You're a technician? Indeed. That's fantastic. Doesn't narrow it down in any way, does it? That really keeps it open for any possible industry in the world. Now, in which world are you a technician? In the planning world. In the planning world? Oh, you, build, you don't even build the houses. You kind of go, that'll fucking fall down. <laughs> Oh, God. Jesus, look at it. On an angle. Who the fuck builds on an angle? <laughs> I haven't been a technician for the last 12 years to know that you don't build a house. Slopey, slopey. Doesn't fucking work. <laughs> so what kinds of appliances do you do? Like whatever, the big buildings, small buildings, uh, tall buildings, schools, it's, hospitals? Uh, it's controversial. It's lots of buildings. It's controversial and lots of buildings. Is it really controversial? Will it split the room? That's what I want from a controversial here. <laughs> I want at some stage, Dan, when you tell us what kind of buildings you do, to have half the room up in arms going, for fuck's sake, Dan, I'm living about it. It's that fucker. It's, who, who, it's the guy who did the fucking controversial building. Wait, let's fucking get him. I want half the room. The other people around defending you, physically holding back that side of the room as they lay into you with sticks and bricks. And you've said controversial. That pitches it at a relatively fucking high level of excitement here. Right? It's going to be amazing when you say this. Try to hold on to your good sense here, ladies and gentlemen. No ripping up the chairs and fucking them down to the top of the hall. Because I know you do that. The minute you hear what this guy builds, you're going to go, Jesus, not that guy. Not that monster of a man. <laughs> have I hyped it up a bit too much, have I? <laughs> it, it's not really that controversial, is it? Is it even a little bit controversial? <laughs> what is it? It's in the, in the green belt. It's in the green... Oh, you build in green belts? Monster. <laughs> you build on green belt and you laugh in children's faces as they stuff their knees in concrete and go, ha ha, there used to be a field here, but look at that, we built houses, houses and everything. Let's not try to do work for God's sake. Let's not bore ourselves talking with you about working this day. What's the most exciting thing you've ever done? Maddest thing you've ever done? Ooh. By all means, take a couple of seconds to think of it. Right? I wouldn't like you to think that I'm on a bit of a fucking clock here, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'll give you an example of some of the ones I've had over the course of the tour. A bloke in Cheltenham called Brian. What's the greatest thing you've ever done? I fell down a manhole. <laughs> a man in Leeds said, what's the greatest thing you've ever done? I was handed an amputated leg. <laughs> what's the greatest thing you've ever done? Anything mad or amazing you've ever done, Dan? Oh, not necessarily mad or amazing. When I met my girlfriend, it was a great thing. It was a great thing to meet your girlfriend. It certainly was. I've no doubt it was. It's a wonderful thing. It's good to have her here tonight as well. How are you, Pat Price? <laughs> Is the girlfriend still with you? She is, yes. She is, but she wasn't worth buying a fucking ticket for this show, was she? <laughs> and you said your pal is here instead. He bought the ticket. He bought the ticket. But he didn't like your girlfriend enough to buy her one as well. 
Yeah, welcome to. Yeah, let's pick a number between one and ten, Dan. Just for the crack. One and ten. Five. You're going to go for five. One, two, three, four, five. How are you, Dan? How are you? Hot. True, isn't it? It's the fickle finger of fate that picked you out, my friend. What's your name, Chance? Scott. Scott. How are you, Scott? And where are you from? Stevenage. Oh, what do you do down in Stevenage? Um, I work for the ambulance service. You work for the ambulance service? Really? This making you pretty fucking bulletproof from where I'm standing at the moment. Right? <laughs> there is frankly nothing I can say to this guy, right? <laughs> Unless he's a really bad job within the ambulance service. You are, you're out there going psh, 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 into the back of Oh, you don't do that at all? Oh, good, thank heavens. What do you do instead? <laughs> I work in an office. You work in an office? Yeah. Do you have like a big, like a map, like whatever, with ambulances and you push them on big poles? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be fantastic? You have tiny little ambulances and a map, and you just move them from place to place. <laughs> it must be great. Do they ever give you a go in the ambulance? Do they? There you go. <laughs> do you dream of that? Do you? Do you have a little hat that you wear at your desk at home with a light on the top, like that, uh, and then you run around with information. I'm just as important as the ambulances. If I didn't give you the information, it, the ambulances wouldn't get there. Do you do that? Do you? You're not a million miles wrong. I'm not a million miles off. Okay. That's a, that's a yes, isn't it? And what's the maddest thing that's ever happened to you? Um, when I was 15, I was in a Fergal Sharky video. You in a Fergal Sharky video? <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> this is part two of your media career. Congratulations. <laughs> you know that behind you, at seven rows behind you, a woman went, ooh, <laughs> really excitedly. I can see you there, Pat. Oh, it's amazing. In a Fergal Sharky video, was it for a good heart as hard to find? No. Because that is frankly the only one anyone knows there are. <laughs> you do occasionally hear, like, like less savvy stories, the joy of doing a gig in London, right, is that you all know the rules of engagement. I ask you a question, you throw the answers out, we have a bit of crack, life is good, right? There are certain parts of the country where they don't know that, right? I was in Newport in Wales. Any Newport people here? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> See the civic pride coming through already, it's amazing. How would you, in a word, describe Newport, my friend? Shite, okay. Uh, that's harsh, right? All I'll say is they clearly had never had a comic there because I would go, hey, what's your name? And the guy literally went, oh, what the fuck is he doing? What's this? What's this? What's this? And he'd look at his wife and go, Jesus, it's like his eyes are falling around the room. Why is it? <laughs> nothing off the first guy, nothing off the second guy, went down the road to the next guy, ended up at the very end. So we sitting right at the end where you are there and going, you, that guy there. And just the blankest canvas I could find. What's the greatest thing you've ever done? And your man goes, oh, God. <sighs> For ages. And the whole crowd are going, Jesus, come up with something. He's getting angry down there. And your man just goes, well, uh, God, I was the Milky Bar kid. <laughs> and then looked to me in a real kind of, is that the kind of thing you were looking for? <laughs> and you're going, yeah, that'll do. Yeah. That's quite healthy as a thing to have. Like, a genuine Milky Bar. Has anyone here ever met a Milky Bar kid? <laughs> it is a weird thing because they are dotted around the place. I once asked in Edinburgh, hey, has anyone ever met a Milky Bar kid? And the woman in the back was, they're not real. Whereas there was a woman in Glasgow who said she'd been chatted up in a bar in Ibiza by a Milky Bar kid. <laughs> and you kind of go, well, how many other angles did he try before he went, I'm getting nowhere here, get out the gun belt, right? Uh, <laughs> and she didn't go for it, which is the bizarrest thing of all, right? Just randomly, Dan, your lady here beside you here, what's your name, Pat? Joe. Joe, Joe, uh, what, would you, if a man came up to you and said, I was a Milky Bar kid, would you? Would you go for it, would you? Would you? You were tempted, of course you'd be tempted. Think of the chocolate, it'd be fantastic, right? There's <laughs> more pertinent than that. Think of being able to turn around midway during the sexual act and going, Oh, the Milky Bar kid is on me. <laughs> it would be a unique once-in-a-lifetime experience to say a phrase that, frankly, you don't get to say enough of in your time. I said. Just to check, by the way, you do lose occasionally people on this because it isn't an international phenomenon, by the way. Certain countries have it, certain countries don't. Any Americans in the room tonight? I was going to say, what part of the States are you from? California. 
from California. Oh, sorry, you were right at the front there, is it? Is it yourself there with the red hair upside down? Yeah. Hello, how are you from California? Yeah. You didn't have this when you grew up, right? No, not until tonight. I never no, no, okay, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. In fact, it's bizarre to explain to an American because they go, I'm sorry, what? And you go, oh, it's a very simple idea, right? In the event of a Wild West conflict. <laughs> The surest path to peace is to send in an albino child with chocolate. <laughs> Nothing calms down a gunfight faster than a small kid going, here, have a bit of fucking chocolate. Ah, I oh, I will. Go on, come on, Wild Bill. We'll have a bit of chocolate. This is mad. Right? Not to be mistaken with the milk tray man. Different guy entirely. You do not want to send the wrong actor to the wrong ad. I have a woman in a negligee walking into a hotel bedroom. Da, 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 da. And there's a small blonde child in a gun bed. <laughs> Just stand there going, I'm out of my depth. <laughs> but I kept in touch with my Milky Bar kid because I wanted to. I didn't even know your man's name. He's only me phone under M for Milky Bar kid, right? <laughs> That's the perfect place to have them, right? I wanted to reunite with all the other Milky Bar kids and create some sort of crime-fighting team of different ages of Milky Bar kids. But it made no sense, because they, see, they never had a superpower. That was the one problem with the Milky Bar kid. He never had any great power. And I used to ask audience to suggest what the obvious superpower that the Milky Bar what like super sense would he have, right? But bizarrely, we got the same answer every time I asked, right? So it just gets you to get what audience is always constant. When I said, what super sense would you give the Milky Bar kid? They always said, taste. No, they never said taste. <laughs> many crimes would you need <laughs> a super sense of taste to solve? Every episode would have to be set in like a chocolate hammer museum or some description. <laughs> oh my god, the curator has been beaten to death. Which of the hammers did it? I know, let's call for the Milky Bar Kid. <laughs> it was a 70% cocoa one. Thank you very much, Milky Bar Kid. You're a genius. No, it wasn't taste. What was it? Something what? Turn people into chocolate. Turn people into chocolate. <laughs> no, no, again, that, that's a first, uh, I have to say. <laughs> that is the bizarre thing, especially in a hot climate, you'd be affected at that stage. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a bad day for you, Mr. Villain. Poof! Ha ha ha! Mr. Son shall finish the job. No, it wasn't that. It was x ray vision, is what most audiences said. <laughs> but not tonight, you've gone a bit freaky. Uh, for some reason. <laughs> Oh, the one night I said to somebody, what super sense would you give me? And your man said, a sense of decorum. <laughs> Which you just don't get enough of in superheroes when they're you know, Like arriving at a crime scene, there's a body and blood and guts everywhere. And you go, oh my God, what are we going to do? And he would come in and go, we shall give the family time to grieve. Back away. <laughs> Back away. The one I particularly got is the reason I, I loved your man, though, Milky Bar Kid, 1968, because uh, I said to him, did you get to say the magic words? And your man goes, no. No, I didn't. They dubbed me out. Because <laughs> in 1968, you people weren't ready for a Welsh Milky Bar Kid. <laughs> you would have found that crazy and ethnic and a bit strange, wouldn't you? You'd go, what? I'm not eating that freaky chocolate from the valleys. <laughs> The Milky Bars are on me. <laughs> so anyway, that's the kind of level we're talking about. My friend, what's your name, sir? James. So, oh, God, somebody else jumped in there at this stage. Simon and Jake, Jason? James. James, are you a local, sir, are you? Yeah, I'm from North London. From North London, and James, what do you do? You're a young man, you're a student, you're a college? I'm a student. Of? Uh, German sociology, history and music. German sociology, history and music. It's a natural Venn diagram, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you can see the intersect. Are you an A-level student? Is that what you are? Oh, God, you're only a child. Look at you. You're a cherub, for Christ's sake. And what a natural collection of A-levels that is. It's just how the employers will be screaming for you. <laughs> crying out. For, we've got a hole in our company the size of a man who knows German sociology, history, but can he play the guitar? <laughs> I know one such man. One such man who does timpani as well as German sociology and history. It's a unique set of talents, my friend, and there's one job out waiting for you in the Goethe Institute band. <laughs> when are the exams? A couple of months' time? A uh, couple of weeks, actually. A couple of weeks? Excuse me, sorry. So good that you're taking a night off from the study at this stage. Yeah. 
What did you schedule for here before you decided to just like piss it all up the tree and come out and do see a comedy gig instead? I'll be doing essays today. Oh, you're doing essays today. Well, there's a welcome break for it. Like, just so you know, by the way, from the rest of us here who've been through the whole school system and that, and have gone to on the other side of the education and all the exams and all that, the stuff you're learning day to day, the, all the subjects and all the quotes and all of that stuff, like whatever, that stuff, when you get out into the real world and you're looking for work and you're meeting people, and all, that stuff is vital. Frankly, hardly a day goes by <laughs> that I don't have to quote a theorem or mention a poem. I, mean, I was in a nightclub the other night and a woman came up and said, what's the biggest of the Great Lakes? And I went, uh, is it Lake Michigan? And she said, close enough, I will go to bed with you. <laughs> Whereas Simon, Simon, what do you do? Um, I work in IT. You work in IT? It's exciting stuff, isn't it, Simon? Who do you do IT for? Direct mailing. For a direct mailing company? <laughs> That's fucking controversial. <laughs> you nothing on that. You just sashayed in and whipped the rug from underneath it. <laughs> Who wants this stuff coming in the door? Nobody! But I still send it. Ha 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 ha! You do that around the office, do you? Send more stuff to Henley. Ha 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 ha! Now we shall blitz North London. Ha 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 ha! You have a big map and like a loads of and you push the direct mail around, indicating where you're going to bring all of your evil direct mail. Ha 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 ha! Finest piece of direct mail I ever received, which is from an estate agent in my area, because they're constantly putting stuff through the door, saying we have disappointed customers who can't find a house in your area. What a fucking guilt trip that was! Oh no, we should move out. <laughs> These people are disappointed. <laughs> anyway, what age are you, my friend? 17, 18? Uh, I'm 17 in three weeks. You're 17, so you're 16. Is the actual answer to that question? <laughs> no amount of I'm 17 in three weeks. I saw through the logic of that one. It's a clever little ruse you've got. <laughs> 16, my friend. My God, good to have you here. You having a bit of a drink while you're here? Go on, too, because you look slightly older. You'll get away with it. Okay. <laughs> we'll get something to do. Like, get, 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 get Simon, because he works for direct mail. He has no morals anyway. He'll go up and down. Stuff you full of drink. Can you drive, by the way? When are you going to start? You can't drive yet, presumably. No, okay, Grant. Like, whatever. When are you going to do it in three weeks' time, presumably? No, because my parents won't pay the insurance. Your parents won't pay for the insurance? Oh. <laughs> you, you little panto crowd. <laughs> There is, there, there, it is, I, I'm intrigued by this tonight because I've, it's something I've done, only done quite recently. Uh, now, I am a little younger than I look, right? Uh, I'm 34, right? Thank you. Uh, I can only hope that the microphone's picked up the cackling woman's laugh of derision. Ha ha ha, you're not. You've been telling this story for a while. Yeah. I genuinely am 34. Let's put it this way. Have you ever seen the show Honey, We're Killing the Kids? Incredible show, incredible show, right? They go around to the houses of parents who aren't very good at being parents, right? It's probably the discreet way of putting it, right? People who feed their kids large and then wonder why they aren't getting up in the morning, right? <laughs> and they bring them to a sealed room and they show them like a computer image of what the child will look like at the age of 40, right? And they go, bing! And the boy always looks like me. <laughs> Every week, they just put up a giant picture of my face. And the parents recoil in horror. The mother can't even look at it. The father shields her. Don't look, don't look, darling. You don't want to see your son like this. Who could live like that? And the BBC woman goes, I know, I know, it's a horrific image. But surely he has to walk around with a bell shouting, unclean, unclean. It's the, most, it's the most irritating every week. Bing! A big picture of me, right? Every week, this hideous future of the child, where the child is like, you know, miserable and, and fat and bald. And then the parents go out feeling terrible, and then they give them a couple of carrots for about three weeks. And they go out on bicycle trips around the countryside, and they all have a much better lifestyle. And then they bring the parents back in again, and they do another, this is what your child will look like now. Bing! And suddenly the child is smiling, at 40, is slim and miraculously is not bald. <laughs> Somehow, a couple of carrots have 
cure the child's genetic male pattern baldness. And every week the parents accept this. The bald father goes, oh, thank heavens, he's got his hair back. Never goes, whoa, wait a minute here. I'm bald, the fecker's going to be bald. There's nothing he can do about it. He's doomed to baldness. No amount of carrots and bicycle trips are good. Why don't you just make him Hispanic if you're going to feck around, right? <laughs> if the whole point is just that, well, screw the science, let's just scare the shit out of the parents, why don't you just go, do 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 bing and have the parents go, Jesus, where did you get the eye patch? <laughs> and the gunshot wound. It is my daughter missing an ear. How did that happen? And the BBC will go, oh, she lost the ear in a fight with a bear in a bar in Minsk. <laughs> You're a terrible parent. <laughs> it's just one of these shows where they send around somebody to life coach people whose lives aren't going very Like Super Nanny, right? Where the Super Nanny walks in and goes to the child, now you can't do that, and does the parent. Listen to how the child is responding to the tone of my voice. And you go, no, it's not. It's responding to the fact that you're a big stranger in the house with a camera crew shouting at it. <laughs> and the kid's going, Jesus, who the fuck is this woman? Right? <laughs> or that one, or that one on Channel 4, that hideous wench, that cow, McKeith. <laughs> are you familiar with You Are What You Eat, my friend? It's an incredible television show, hosted by a whiny, naggy, bony, seed pimp bitch. <laughs> who goes onto the homes of morbidly obese people, who we are introduced to in a slow-motion video package where they are pictured walking across uneven ground <laughs> or on a rope ladder of some description. <laughs> Something hideously unflattering. And then Gillian, as their visual, shows them a table of all the food they've eaten in the last week. A table heaving, creaking, groaning under the weight of pies and curries and chips and beer. And Gillian points to the table and goes, Look at it! <laughs> Look at it! <laughs> this is what you ate in the last week. And the fat person looks at it. And their face is a mixture of pride. <laughs> and lust. I said, did, did I eat all that? I did it all again. <laughs> but they don't get to eat that. They get the next week's table, which is an empty table with an apple sitting in the middle of it. <laughs> and they don't even get the apple. They get to jump at the apple and it's lit slightly above them. Ah, give us the apple, it was. <laughs> she nags them thin for six weeks. And that's not even the worst part of it, my friend. The worst part of it can be summed up with one word. What is the worst part of that show? The poo! <laughs> they analyse their poo for no obvious diagnostic value whatsoever. <laughs> Have we any doctors in the room tonight? <laughs> Few doctors around. Doctor, can you confirm to me, is there any value whatsoever diagnostically in examining these people's poo? <laughs> no, because we don't get any interesting results. We just get the woman coming back from the lab going, we've analysed your poo, it turns out you're eating too much. <laughs> and then she hides in their fridge for six weeks, and every time they want a snack, she comes out with icicles on her nose going, nah, you can't have a snack, Close the door. <laughs> the bit that irritates me about is the bullshit science that she comes up with, though, because whatever, there is a science to nutrition, there is technical information about you that, that needs to be get across. She just makes stuff up, I think. <laughs> She just does some stuff about different vibrational energies for food and food of different colours and all this yadda yadda. She might as well just say, eat broccoli, because in broccoli there live imps. <laughs> they will climb out of the broccoli at night and mine the fat off your arse. <laughs> if you are what you eat, she's eating a feckin' shrew. All of which is basically, I'm 34, right? OK, Grant. And I did a thing that I should have done at 17, which I learned, I learned to drive this year. How many of you, how many of you learned to drive at 17? Yeah. A load of you. And congratulations and good for you, right? Uh, I did drive before, but I drove in Ireland, where, frankly, we're a little looser about stuff like that. <laughs> 
I mean, any Irish would looking back me up on this. It's a bit kind of, hey, send off for the license, and then you get in the post, and it's practically like the police going, listen, you don't do things by the book, but I like your style. Get out there. <laughs> It's quite cool. You're very strict about stuff in this country. You've got laws for everything. There's a Road Traffic Act, 1988, includes a law which says you may not drive a car in the UK while operating a handheld microphone. An unbelievably specific law, which is clearly because of one sham which is driving around going, how are you? Hey, you're looking very well. But does it... Love the hat, Mary, love the hat. Hang on a second. Hello, officer. What? Well, there's no law against it. <laughs> oh, there is? Oh. <laughs> and now there is a law against it, because you're terribly prescriptive in this country. You think things are all legal or illegal. That's the way it works for you. And there's a line, bang, that's good, that's not good. Not the way we do things in Ireland. In Ireland, we have a greater appreciation of the greyness in the human condition between the white and the black, of the arbitrary, of the vagueness, of the fuzziness of human behaviour. There are three states of legality in Irish law. There is all this stuff here, which comes under, that's grand. <laughs> then it moves into, ah, now, don't push it. <laughs> and finally into, right, you're taking the piss. <laughs> and that's where the police sweep in, right? So I drove for years, but finally had to do the test. You know, when you're older, it's a different experience. I mean, my friend with the ambulance thing, what age were you? 18. You're 18 or whatever. By the way, as a teenager, did you find it a bit embarrassing being in this stupid-looking car? Uh, I was taught by the Air Force. You were taught by the Air Force? <laughs> oh my Lord, you have a backstory we didn't even get close to asking about here. Why were you taught? Why, why, did somebody leave you outside an Air Force base in a reed basket as a child? <laughs> and all the officers gather around and go, we shall raise him as our own. <laughs> and then have a pact where they all went like that. Are we agree? All right, Air Force, go! Uh, <laughs> that does make him sound like a gay crime-fighting team, some description. <laughs> Air Force, go, go, yeah! Uh, sorry. You were taught by the Air Force. Yeah. Was it actual cars or was you, you taxied planes up and down and then they'd like, on, on runways and the lights would stop and you'd have to sit in your F-14 jet <laughs> and then find the bite spot, find the biting point, find the biting point in the jet. Now, indicate, where's the blind, the blind spot of the jet is everything over the wing over there, right? <laughs> and presuming all this shit, it was just a car. Uh, Land Rover. A Land Rover. <laughs> really? And what, what, was there any other unnecessary levels of difficulty they wanted to include? <laughs> Did you have to do it in the middle of the night under gunfire or something like that? <laughs> you still have to do, like, a civilian driver's test. A uh, civilian driver's test, yeah. But did you go in, like, the Land Rover? Yeah. Was it like, you know, Ford Escort, Ford Escort, Ford Escort, Land Rover! Ford Escort, Ford Escort. <laughs> so, which car would be yours? Man dressed head-to-toe in camouflage gear and wings. <laughs> <laughs> Take a wild guess. <laughs> <laughs> OK, can you read out the registration number? Yes, it's uh, K-I-L-L-U. Uh, <laughs> go, go, go. Where, where are we at? <laughs> The best thing about learning to drive at 34 is, you know, when you, it's like, did you ever stall the Land Rover? Uh, yes. Yes, you did. I presume nobody behind you went, Bleh. nobody does that to a Land Rover here with RAF written across it. I said, Jesus, get out of the way, get out of the way. Like, the door opens and they all go, 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 boom, and then jump onto it. <laughs> when you learn to drive at 17, yes, it is embarrassing. When you stall the car the first time, like whatever, watch out for this, my young friend. It's mortifyingly embarrassing, right? Because you do think at 17, because, you know, you haven't been around the block, you think, Jesus, I am holding up the entire world at this stage. <laughs> All traffic has halted because of me, and there's a helicopter floating above my head, radioing the news into radio stations going, well, it's all going very well, but one Egypt has stalled the car, <laughs> and there are pregnant women having children behind him who can't get to hospitals, and it's a nightmare, right? At 17, you stall a car, somebody goes, beep, behind you, you panic, and you start pressing every button in the car, and turning things, and moving things, and stamping things, and the windscreen wipers are wildly going left and right, and the radio's coming on and off, and it's a nightmare. Not when you're 34. Second lesson, I stole the car at the lights. Didn't quite get the biting point. Chugga chug, car stopped. A guy in a BMW behind me, like a half a second later, just goes, Barrr! really, really loudly and really rudely, right? If I was 17, I might have fallen apart. At 34, you have a bedrock of confidence that's built up over the years. <laughs> I didn't panic. I calmly put on the handbrake got out of the car. <laughs> what? 
walked back to the man in the BMW and went, eh, uh, is there a problem here, champ, is there? <laughs> and your man went, oh, I was just thinking that you hadn't quite left from the light as quick. Who? you're a lot bigger than I was expecting you to be at this time. Uh, yeah, I am a lot bigger. And you're right, I haven't quite left from the lights with the kind of a greyhound out of a trap kind of speed that you were hoping for here. But let's have a look at the entire situation here. Are there any clues, perhaps, to what we see in front of us here as to why I might not have been as fast as other drivers? <laughs> Take, for example, the giant pyramid of L's on top of the car. What do you think the L might stand for in this situation? Does it mean, warning, driver is lackadaisical? I may need to be reminded of the urgency of your trip. Or does it mean, hey, the guy in this car is louche? I'm likely to be sitting there going, I do not like this green. Let us wait for another green. So satisfying to be able to do that. And then you think of all the other things that at 34 you'd love to go back. Any of those ridiculous run-ins you had as a 17-year-old, whether with your first boss or with people in your class, any time when you came out lesser and now you realize, geez, I didn't have to put up with that. Or women with the best will in the world, you're wonderful creatures. But Jesus, you scared the shit out of me at 17. <laughs> I'd be in bed with a woman at 17 and if things would go wrong, I would panic and I start pressing everything and moving it and shifting things around and the head's going wildly left and right. Not anymore. Now I just calmly pull out. I walk around. I go, eh, is there a problem here, champ? Is that? He goes, yeah, I was just thinking, ha, huh, you're a lot smaller than I was expecting you to be. Anyway, at the end of the day, all you get is one other card, one other piece of identification, which, frankly, we have enough of at this stage. We have enough ridiculous kind of bits of plastic or passwords. We don't need another identity card. I think we have enough of these pieces of paper. That. And obviously now chip and pin has come in, which is another ridiculous thing that we've had. Like whatever. My, friend, my friend here, Simon, how many credit cards do you have or debit cards or that kind of stuff? I've got two. Two at this stage. Do you have different pin numbers for each? Yes. Yeah, you do. How do you remember them? Do you not have a system? Do you, did you pick them specially? Did you just take them? Just remember them. You just remember them. Okay, Grant. So they haven't, you haven't chosen them particularly to, you know, I know we are kind of two questions away from identity theft at this stage. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. What's your mother's maiden name? I think it's ridiculous as they all get narrowed. There was no identity theft until our identity became four digits. I mean, there was no identity theft when you had to sign for stuff. Because no, that's difficult to do. Faking somebody's signature isn't an easy thing to do. We've all tried to do it. Like, Dara won't be in school today, Dara's mammy. <laughs> it didn't work out, right? We learned early that. But four digits is a doddle. It doesn't matter what system you have. Oh, I've got an incredible system. I have my year of birth, and I have my wife's year of birth. I still pack my children's year of birth, and I divide my Chico's career in weeks. I don't know. Whatever you have, right? <laughs> And you have a whole special thing worked out, and you go, no, no one will ever guess. Oh, good for you. Unfortunately, you're four foot eight. I look over your shoulder in boots. <laughs> like that, right? Ridiculously straightforward. And we've enough of the damn thing. The passport alone, for God's sake, should have all the information without getting another bloody thing. And even as it is, like, I flew recently from Stansted up to Prestwick, right? And we were at the Ryanair flight from London to Glasgow, went to the counter, said, I'd like to fly. And your man says, uh, do you have your passport? And I said, no, of course I don't have my passport. I'm flying internally. Unless there's been a massive political upheaval in the last 27 minutes. I'm not expecting to arrive in Glasgow and have a man in a trench coat walk down the middle of the plane going, Wo ist deine Papierchen? Haben Sie deine Papierchen? Give me deine Fahrkarten. Give me deine Fahrkarten. Yeah, make a Fahrkarten. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so good, deine Fahrkarten. So good, yeah. Good luck. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, not expecting that to happen. But I, no, I said to him, I don't have my passport. And your man said, well, I'm going to need some form of photo identification. And I had to fish through my wallet. And I found like, an old work ID, and I handed it to your man. I said, there you go. And he goes, I'm afraid this is out of date. <laughs> and I went, well, I'm still him. <laughs> and your man went, touche? Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> I can't argue with that. Go on, go on and play. <laughs> okay. 
And I know it's because there's a greater sensitivity at the moment, and I know it's because there's a war, and I know because bombs going off in London and all that. And I'll say this as someone who's been living in the city for about three or four years. I was here last summer when the bombs went off. Well done. It was spectacular how it was handled in the city. It was very, very impressive, right? I heard lots of stuff over the years about London spirit and all that, but when it really happened, it was amazing to watch, right? And I do tell people that the way when the bombs went off on the 7th of July, the city reacted in a phenomenally London way. The entire place went, oh my God, there's a bomb on the Piccadilly line. Well, I can get the Victoria line. <laughs> It is quite funny the way we, or people who live in London, are obsessed with transport. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, that'll work out. Yeah, that'll work out. In fact, I, that could be slightly faster. Uh, so. It's just bizarre for me that the two things happened one day after the other, the announcement of the Olympics and then the bombs going off, six and the seventh, right? And the reaction essentially from Londoners was the same. An incredible piece of news, but how am I supposed to get home? <laughs> it's, it's just, it, what's it going to do to my journey, right? And there is one thing I do love about that joke. There are two things I love about that joke. Firstly, I think it says something very fundamental about people who live in London. Secondly, I love the awkward silence just before I get to the funny bit. <laughs> where people are going, whoa, where are you going with this? You better watch what you're saying very carefully, guys. <laughs> And of course I am. But do allow me just to say this, on behalf of all the Irish people here, that for once, for once in my lifetime, <laughs> we're able to go, what? You're going to England? <laughs> She wouldn't go there. She's full of terrorists. We've no terrorists at all. <laughs> They're on playwrights now. <laughs> and I genuinely are. It's a bizarre thing about it, right? There's a guy called Danny Marson, right? Any Irish people remember who Danny Marson is? Danny. Yes, that's a man, right? Okay. D Danny Marson was bizarrest job title in the world: the public relations officer for the IRA. <laughs> On a day-to-day -day level, how does that job work? Going into safe houses in Belfast, filled with men in balaclavas, and going right. <laughs> I've organised a photo shoot. <laughs> Nothing too major, just something bright and breezy, just to get the name around again. Because <laughs> frankly, out in the streets, all I'm hearing is UVF, UVF, UVF. <laughs> Danny wrote a play called The Wrong Man, which was performed at the Edinburgh Festival. Right? And I was up there. The two lads from the IRA play walked up to me and then came up to me and handed me a flyer for the play and said, "You must come to the play." And I said, "Of course, I'd love to get to the play." Right? Never got. To, you never get to somebody else's show when you're doing your own show in Edinburgh. Right? So about a week later, I minded my own business in a bar when the two lads walked up to me again, handed me another flyer. You've been told twice. <laughs> I went every night, <laughs> and I was up at the end going, "Well done, well done, grand establishment, coming to Mr. Fitzgerald's show." So anyway, my friend, what's your name, sir? Uh, Mark. And what do you do? I organise 40th birthday parties for my friends. You organise 40th birthday parties for your friend, but well, you're going to run out of business very quickly, I imagine. <laughs> when you're not doing that for your friends, which is a nice thing for you to do, when you're not doing that, what else do you do? Uh, project manager. You're a project manager. You do projects. <laughs> I had to do projects in school as well. It was mad. <laughs> so, what part do you do? Do you look after the sticky bits that you put the, the pictures of the, of the rockets on the sheet, or do you do the sprinkles? Do you have to handle the scissors? Is that what you want me as a project manager, in case the kids cut their fingers? Is that what you do? Yes. <laughs> what kind of industry do you project manage? Uh, banking. For banking, it gets better and better and better and better and better. <laughs> hmm? American banking. American banking. So it's banking with a twang. <laughs> Banking with a bit of an accent. Oh, English banking not good enough for you, is not? Oh, Mr. Fancy Pants Dollar Boy here, is it? Uh, what's the happiest thing you've ever done, my friend? What's the craziest thing, nicest thing, unique thing about you? Mark. Run the London Marathon. You ran the London Marathon? Not the one a week ago, was it? No, no, ten years ago. Mm, ten years ago. <laughs> You're kind of coasting on that success a bit now, aren't you? Uh, it's been a long old decade, hasn't it? Ten years ago, and you're still banging on about the fucking marathon. Yeah, you've got to let it go, my friend. That was a long time ago. How long did it take you to do it? 
three hours, nine minutes. Three hours, nine minutes is pretty good. Well done, congratulations. Like, whatever. I never asked you a nice thing. I always act like you're a villain of some description because of the whole direct mail thing, but you're probably a lovely person with kittens and puppies and all sorts of stuff, right? <laughs> Are you? I've got two cats. You've got two cats. <laughs> I have two cats as well, right? This is just an aside. I wasn't even going to talk about this. Two cats that we got from Hounslow Animal Welfare Service, right? Which is a wonderful service, but they shouldn't use the abbreviation. They actually, on all of them, they answer the phone and go, whores. Uh, <laughs> which is just shoddy, right? Given that you're about to go, I'd like a pussy. Yeah. I haven't thought it through. <laughs> what was I talking about before? Oh, yeah, the Bible. That's what I was talking about. Uh, themed, lads. It's all very delicately themed, but it is. It's about rules and laws and stuff like that and how I don't do them, right? And bizarrely, the Irish don't do authority and we don't do laws, but we kind of got stuck in the Bible a bit. And as I said, not a religious man, but when I say religion, Irish, Irish people are very religious in one way, or where anyway. Very ignorant about the world, religions of the world. Ridiculously bad when it comes to all the world. We have no real clue, right? I used to do a routine years ago about the millennium bug and about how different religions in the world had different calendars. Like in the Muslim faith, it's about the year 1470, 1480, this stage, and in the Jewish faith is about the year 5,700. Any Jewish people here tonight? Can you tell me what year it is? Can you? No. Okay. <laughs> you went on quite a little journey there, didn't you? Hey, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, you're not up for a rabbi just yet, but I'm glad you're taking part anyway. It's about the year 5,700. That's not the weirdest answer. I was in Cork uh, in the south of, uh, of Ireland. I, good to have you here, lads. I wouldn't cheer. You don't come out of this one well. Right, so... <laughs> Cork, fantastic part of the world. But there was one woman misrepresented you hideously last <laughs> night. I said, anyone Jewish here? Someone goes, I'm Jewish. I said, are you Jewish? She goes, I am. I said, and what year is it now in the Jewish calendar? And she goes, eh, I wasn't expecting questions, to be honest. <laughs> And then turned to her presumably Gentile friend and had a bit of a natter. And then came back with the single finest answer I have ever heard from a member of an audience. Where without any shame at all, she just went, Yeah, it's the Jewish year of the rat. <laughs> Incredible piece of ignorance. To take these two great world cultures and slam them together. Oh, those crazy kung fu Jews, am I? <laughs> With their rice and their noodles. And the fireworks, oi vey! <laughs> so no, we had all the other stuff. We had all the kind of Catholicism and all that kind of stuff. And even that, that gets on my nerves at this stage because I'm not a man for texts and holding to texts really strictly, like laws and rules and regulations. And the Bible thing in particular, for God's sake, we've moved on, right? If you're a religious person, fine, go for that, whatever you're into. But at least in this part of the world, we don't take it literally. There's nobody like there is in America going, no, no, Genesis is a historical fact. And you're going, for God's sake, Genesis, which is a load of fairy stories to get the kids to go to bed on a donkey ride to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, right? <laughs> Stop taking it literally. It's only the Bible. It's not gospel. <laughs> not every word in it is supposed to be true, right? For God's sake. And, they, and people give out about evolution, right? This wonderful thing that we invented and we came up with this fantastic theory to explain incredibly complex things. And people go, no, no, it's not in the book. It can't be right. How could, and they, other little arguments, creationist arguments like, oh, you, how could the eye just have evolved? It must be a gift from God. And you're going, no, oh, you're not getting the point. The whole point of evolution is that random things just happened and the useful ones hung around, right? Basically, there were loads of blind monkeys. <laughs> And then one day, a one-eyed monkey wandered into the middle of it all and rode everything left, right and centre. And he was king of the monkeys until Mr. Feckin' Two Eyes sashayed into the clearing. It's a wonder I'm not invited to more churches in Alabama to hear that speech. But it just depressed that people go, no, God made buff. Oof, there you go, God made us exactly as we are, right? No, of course he didn't, for God's sake. Three arguments up against that. A, have a look at yourself. <laughs> if you truly think you were created by God, get out of the shower in the morning and look at yourself for a while in the mirror. This is the same guy, apparently, who made mountaintops and sunsets. What kind of off day exactly was he having <laughs> when he threw you together? Argument two, if we were truly created by God, then why do we still occasionally bite the insides of our own mouths? <laughs> Have you ever felt less divine 
then when you suddenly go, oh, I seem to have bitten my thumb on the inside of my mouth. I seem to have chewed at my cheek there. I seem to have forgotten where my lips were. I was so eager to eat that place of pasta, I've eaten through my own face. <laughs> and argument C against the divine creator, the appendix. Why would he put it in you when it does nothing except randomly kill you for no good reason? Just sit there doing nothing and then fall apart and kill him. Kill him now! <laughs> Scott, do you still have your appendix here? You? you do indeed, because a good RAF man always holds on to his appendix. <laughs> Who knows the day you might fall behind enemy lines and have to eat grass for a while. <laughs> This is an evil creature, the appendix. And then they bring you to hospital, and then you get out of hospital, and you've got to spend a month being approached by Egypt's well-meaning fools coming up going, Jesus, I heard you're in hospital. How's your appendix? And you go, I don't know. They took it out. We haven't kept in touch. For all I know, it's driving around the country in a van, solving mysteries at the moment. And then, my favourite of all, is there, are there any nurses in the room tonight? Yes. OK, Granny. Check with the nurses here. Do you ever, on the street, after people have been in the hospital, walk up to them when they're perfectly healthy and go, Jesus, you won't remember me. Last time I saw you was lying down, unconscious, painted yellow. Do you ever do that, do you? Good. Because it creeps us out. Three years after my appendix operation, a nurse comes up to me in a bar and goes, Ah, how are you? I was in the theatre when they took out your appendix which is like a really icky way to start a conversation. <laughs> and I went, ugh. Right? But to continue the chat, I went, apparently, says I, they got it out just in time. And she leans in and goes, I know. <laughs> it came apart in our hands. <laughs> and you go, ugh, that's horrible. And B, it makes it sound like you took it out and then threw it to each other as a game. <laughs> no, you take it, no, you take it, no, you... Oh, no, it's come apart in my hand. <laughs> And then you start wondering about all the other things she might remember from that day. And frankly, yes, you do go, ah, no, she's seen my cock. <laughs> and they keep those operating theatres very cold. <laughs> I wasn't looking my best that day. I didn't expect to be judged on it years later. Oh, thank you very much. I would have fluffed myself up if I thought that was going to be the best. I would have flared like a peacock, made a bit of a show of myself. No, we were not created buffed by God, right? I am a science man, I'm a nerd for all that kind of stuff. And I understand people find it bewildering science because it's difficult and we know lots of stuff now and it's tough to keep up with what's happening and it moves very fast. And there is a reason for that. There's a thing in technology called Moore's Law. Does anyone here know what Moore's Law is? Yes. Yeah, I was kind of hoping rather than just saying yes, you'd actually furnish us with the information, right? Because <laughs> right now you're like the worst quiz show contestant in history. For a million pounds, do you know the capital of Mongolia? I do. <laughs> I'll take the cash. There you go. I, I was rather hoping you'd tell me. Well, you didn't ask that. You merely asked if I knew. And I do. Thank you very much. I'll take the cash. Right. Check that question again. Lads, what is Moore's Law? After 90 for 18 months. Yes, it is. Computers get half the size or twice the speed or half the price every year and a half. It's the reason why the whole industry just gets faster and faster and faster. Like the iPod, for example, right? I have an iPod at 60 gigabytes in capacity. It'll take 1,500 albums. I own 90 albums. <laughs> My iPod sits at home sullen and frustrated <laughs> and underused, like a wife who gave up her career and the kids turned out to be shite. They come up with stuff just to fill the machines. They had one called iPod Photo, which you go, oh, you can put your music and your photos. As if anyone ever asked for that. As if anyone in history has ever gone, oh, I've got a long train journey ahead of me. What I need now is some music and all of my holiday photographs <laughs> of the last nine years. <laughs> Nonsense of the highest order, and it does have the technology belts along, like whatever, and it is bewildering for people. James, my young friend over here, you're across this stuff because you're 16, you're 17, you know, you're all about MP3s and all. You're, you're across this stuff, aren't you? I don't have a computer. You don't have a computer? <laughs> oh. Now we're looking at the essays in a completely different light. James, like some sort of monk, just slowly, <laughs> in longhand, painting out his German verbs on the table. Other kids, what are you doing, James? Get with the fucking program! 
<laughs> you don't even have a computer. And you, do you have an iPod or an MP3? Oh, James. James, get with the program. It's fantastic. Get with it now before it runs away too far from you, right? Because basically technology will thump and go. And when it goes, it never comes back. You basically run alongside technology for a part of your life and you're racing along and technology is striding. And you go, Jesus, technology, what are you today? And technology is going on a phone. You can carry all over the world. And you go, Jesus, that's brilliant. Now what are you? I'm a phone with a camera built into it. Jesus, that's great technology. Now what are you? I'm a phone with a camera and a breville sandwich maker and a clear all foot <laughs> And at some point, James, you just go, Jesus, I've got a fucking stitch. Go on, go on, I can't keep up. <laughs> it's harsh, it's tough. And every section of our life has a sudden splurge of technology all the time that we have to deal with. Even the car driving test that I did isn't fully preparing you for the fact that every car in five years' time will have a little talking box telling you what to do, right? Every car will have a sat-nav in the next five, ten years. And we've got to be ready for that. I'm saying this from experience. I have a sat-nav not from one of the massive international companies, right? I have a really bad sat-nav from a company. <laughs> so bad, they couldn't employ a professional voiceover artist to read out the phrases. They just got Terry from the office to do it, right? In a really harsh East London accent. <laughs> when my machine goes, turn right now, you turn right. <laughs> you veer wildly across three lanes of traffic. You don't check your blind spot, you don't consult the mirrors, you just go for it. You don't want the machine to go, you miss a turn, you fucking map it. <laughs> and the damn thing can't find the satellite for the first 25 minutes of every journey. It's just a blank screen with cannot locate satellite. And you sit there screaming, look up! <laughs> look up for Jesus' sake! It's bound to be in the sky somewhere! Stop glancing around yourself going, Jesus, where did I leave the satellite? This is around here somewhere. Mary, check the table in the hall. I might have left it in there. Where is that satellite? You end up reaching forward and tilting the machine upwards, going, boom, boom, bang, it's up there. All parts of technology, all parts of your life have some sort of new development that you're supposed to keep up with. Simon, when's the last time you bought a bed? This year, I think. This year, you bought one this year, did you? And where did you go to a bed emporium to buy it, did you, Simon? I did, yeah. You did. What bed emporium did you go to? Called Dreams. Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and how many did you look at? Three or four. Three? Yeah. Oh, quite the Goldilocks, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's your standard way to buy a bed, right? Whereas, Scott, when's the last time you bought a bed? Last year. Last year as well? God, there was a flurry of beds being sold last year. <laughs> how many did you try in the day? Two. Two. So he's going down. It's got more definite. Military man. Doesn't bother around with these things. It's not hard enough. Where's the hardest bed you have here? Just give me some reeds and lay them in a corner of the room and I'll curl up there in a fetal position. I'll be fine. <laughs> your style, my friend. <laughs> Last time I bought a bed, went into a bed place, right? First bed was too soft. I said to the bed salesman, it's too soft. And the finest salesman I've ever met, he just went, well, some people are afraid of comfort. An astonishing challenge to put before you. You find her standing in the middle of a bed department going, screw you, I can handle comfort. Give me seven of these mattresses, stack them high. And give me duvets of many tog, I'll be able to take it. Put a pea underneath the bottom mattress, I'll find it with my arse. Away from that, I didn't like that bed, didn't like that bed, didn't like that. Tried a load of beds, right? Because I'm some pansy ass civilian, my friend. <laughs> Tried a load of beds, I didn't like any of them. Eventually, your man said, Well, then you should try the NASA bed. <laughs> I went, Oh. <laughs> the NASA bed, right, is a foam bed that when you lie onto it, the foam sinks underneath your weight and gathers around you, holding you close so that you don't toss and turn. You feel like a computer part being shipped to Singapore. <laughs> They might as well put you in a cardboard box and fill it with polystyrene beads. You're jammed into the bed, like, mm, like that, right? I had the bed says, I'm looking over me going, how's that, is that right? Is it good? Is it good? And I go, I, I don't like it, I don't like it at all. I don't like it, I'm trapped, I'm trapped. And he said, it's great, it's lovely, isn't it great? And they leaned over and straddled me with, how's that, is it good, is that? <laughs> good, you're liking that, aren't you? That you're loving that, aren't you, you dirty boy? Oh, you're loving that, you're loving. Which I thought was inappropriate behaviour in the department. <laughs> And I said to him, no, I don't like this bed. And he said to me, it's a NASA bed. And I went, I'm not 12. I'm not so impressed by the word NASA that I'm going to immediately rush out and buy the damned thing. Or, oh, give me three of them and a duvet cover with a space shuttle on it. 
This bed has been designed to address very specific environmental conditions, which, frankly, my house isn't going to undergo at any time. <laughs> and if it does, if I wake up and a Russian floats past my field of vision, <laughs> my first thought isn't going to be, well, at least I've slept well. Every field of life, technology is moving it on and making it bewildering for us. But the key thing is you've got to go with change. When change occurs, you can't be sitting there resisting it like a fool. You can't be holding on to the past, rooting yourself and going, oh, things were better. Things were better. In all fields of life, immigration, things change. This country gives itself an aneurysm over immigration. You handle multiculturalism better than any society in the world at the moment. You are so good. You give shit back to cultures they never knew they had. <laughs> There are a billion people in India going, what's a Balti exactly? <laughs> Things change, you can't be holding on to it. Nostalgia is heroin for old people. That's all it is. <laughs> but ah, oh, things are better in the old days. <laughs> they weren't better. You couldn't turn on a light during the 40s in this country without the Luftwaffe bombing the shit out of it. <laughs> That's not better. For Christ's sake, just because you were younger and getting laid more often doesn't mean the place is better off, right? <laughs> Ridiculous notions like that, like, but stuff changes. Attitudes change, values change. Even as a comedian, you occasionally come across something, you make a joke that, you know, gets you into trouble because the attitudes have changed. I did a joke last year, and this is not a good joke. I have no excuse. It's a terrible joke, right? <laughs> I'm just offering as Exhibit A. It was about the musical Billy Elliot. Mm. And what was the composer's inspiration for the music? The joke was, Elton John, do you think he saw a little of himself in Billy Elliot? <laughs> I know, it was rubbish. I didn't mean it as an attack on Elton John or as an attack on the gay community. I meant it as yet another joke in the glorious tradition of jokes involving the word in. As in, <laughs> do you have any Irish in you? Would you like some? <laughs> but instead we got a letter of complaint from Peter Tatchell and the gay rights campaign group Outrage who said that I was a disgrace and should never be allowed to work again uh, and the joke was contributed to a culture of violence against gay men in Britain. Those of you unfamiliar with the work of Outrage, the previous target of one of their campaigns was Robert Mugabe. <laughs> and now me. <laughs> and the thing is, your initial reaction when somebody does a complaint like that is to get, ah, you know, is to get all tough and go, ah, it's only a joke for Jesus' sake, relax, right? Swiftly followed by loftier arguments about civil rights and comedy's obligation to say the difficult thing and freedom of speech which is a fairly lofty point to bring in to back up something as bad as that joke about Billy Elliot, right? You wouldn't go to Strasbourg to the European Court of Human Rights with that as your argument. Oh, my lords, my ladies of the court. Elton John, you think he's all little of himself in Billy Elliot? <laughs> Try the fish, I'm here all week. Thank you very much. <laughs> and in fact, if a gay man ever walked up to me and said, do you know what, that's just another joke about how we're supposed to touch kids, and we don't, there's no paedophilia homosexuality relation at all, I'd have no argument with that whatsoever, right? Because frankly, if you don't change your attitudes when you realise you've screwed up, then I might as well just go and play golf with Jim Davidson on a Saturday morning <laughs> and go, Jesus, Jim, I'm getting awful trouble off the queers at the moment, you know? <laughs> What seems to be the problem, Dara? Ah, they can't take a feckin' joke. They take a cock of their arse, but they can't take a joke. <laughs> that was intended ironically, by the way. <laughs> and I, some people think that's very politically correct of me, but then I'm Irish, right? And of all the people who've benefited from a good dose of political correctness on this island, it's been the Irish. Remember the good old days with the jokes about how stupid we were? And then a memo went around sometime in the 80s where you all went, oh, Jesus, we're not doing jokes about the Irish anymore. And you went, OK, fine, and you just stopped. And thank you very much. A bit overdue, but thanks very much nonetheless. <laughs> Because we didn't really enjoy that kind of stuff, like, and it's, it's good that we don't get that kind of reputation. Just so you know, there are still plenty of stupid people dotted around Ireland, but you're not allowed to talk about them. <laughs> there was a fire engine called out last year because there was a cat stuck up a tree in Limerick. Lads drove out, took the cat down, gave it back to the old woman. She said, lads, will you have a glass of whiskey? This is a completely true story. The lads said, we will, of course, have a glass of whiskey. The other crew are on at the moment. It's fine. So she, they had the glass of whiskey. They had another glass of whiskey. The whole town came out, had a bit of crack with the fire engine. Life was good. Eventually, they said, listen, we better go back now. They waved goodbye to the village. They waved goodbye to the old woman. They got back into the fire engine, drove off, ran over the fucking cat. <laughs> Completely true story, and you're not allowed to tell it. It's brilliant, isn't it? 
Because the thing is, the joy of it is, like, whatever. Of the Irish people, where are the Irish people again? Yeah. Who's the most recent immigrant among you? <laughs> Let's go back. Who, who's only been out of the. Where, where you, how long are you out of the country, sir? Two weeks. Two weeks? That's pretty recent as an immigrant, it has to be said, right? The thing about Ireland is, Ireland is a bit of cash. We've changed in Ireland. Oh, we've changed. Oh, this is our favourite line about ourselves. Oh, two weeks? You can never go back. You won't recognise the place when you go back. It's changed. Oh, those two weeks, the country's gone so much different. It's, you wouldn't recognise it. You can never go back. We're loving this about ourselves because we finally got a bit of cash in our pockets and we love the notion, oh, we're not the same place we were. We've lost our soul, we've lost our spirit. We're exactly the same age as we always were, right? But with a bit of cash. There's no change. Well, there's one change in Ireland. Baguettes. <laughs> there's a lot more baguettes in Ireland than there ever were when I was growing up there. Even in the two weeks since you left, my friend, that place has gone baguette crazy. You can't move for baguettes. When I was there, a sandwich was a sandwich. Bit of bread, bit of ham, bit of cheese. Here's another bit of bread. That's a sandwich. Now it's second baguettes in every direction. <laughs> but I'll say this for the Irish. We do baguettes in a way that no French person has ever done baguettes. <laughs> we have a unique take on the baguette that the French could only dream of. No French person in history has ever walked into a baguetteria or whatever the hell the name of the shop is. What's the name of the place that sells baguette? A baguette shop. Yeah, I meant in Paris. The right? <laughs> shop de baguette. What's it called? It's called a boulangerie, of course it is. In fact, I know that. I just love getting people to shout out boulangerie in the middle of a gig because it's the sexiest kind of lingerie. <laughs> what are you wearing tonight? My boulangerie. Yeah. Oh, I love the way the tits light up. I know. It's great. <laughs> no one has ever walked into a boulangerie and gone, je veux une baguette. And they've gone, ah, oh, tu veux une baguette? Nous sommes une boulangerie. Nous avons beaucoup de baguettes. Qu'est-ce que tu veux dans la baguette? Peut-être le jambon ou le fromage? No Parisian has ever gone, no, je veux pas le jambon, ni le fromage. Je veux un full Irish breakfast. <laughs> we, we exactly hash browns, beaucoup de hash browns. And actually, that, any baked beans, aussi, beaucoup de baked beans, right? <laughs> now, wrap it in cling film, I'll put it in the passenger seat of the car. Right, so. <laughs> But the fact that in Ireland we went all the way from being stupid ones to being Nobel laureate, river dancing, chorus, whatever that we are at the moment, right? These tags are so arbitrary, they're so randomly assigned, whatever. That, and as a comedian, if you work for a while, you spot that there are just buttons you can press with regard to the peoples of the world, right? Because we basically, all of us, have a list in our head of the countries we know, and we've one or two words beside to describe the people in them, right? Because we're busy people, we can't have fully formed impressions of all the people in the world, right? So we, it narrows down to a couple of very common phrases all the time. Right? My friend from California, you may wish to block your ears just for a tiny moment at this stage. Right? <laughs> I'll give you an example. If I said to you, Americans, uh, what are they like as people? Americans are <laughs> fat and <laughs> stupid. Those are the two things. <laughs> Every gig I do, fat and stupid. The French are <laughs> arrogant and <laughs> smelly. That's it. <laughs> Every gig, the same two words. The Dutch are stoned, right? That's that. <laughs> it's harsh, but like you know, and clearly these things aren't true. But the joy of this thing is, you can do that for a few different countries, right? But then it peters out quite dramatically when you get a little bit outside of Europe, right? Or I said the English speaking space. None of us, as a crowd, would go Slovenia. Ah, joys, it's those feckers. Ah, sure, they're you know, uh, you know, rampant and you know, and well read. I don't. This, we don't have. <laughs> Phrase for all these people. Oh, the Tongans are tall and, and well mannered. It just it, We don't have phrase for all the countries of the world. And there's loads of obscure countries in the world that we know nothing about, right? So feck it. We should just make shit up. <laughs> Every five years in the UN, there should be a draw, like a giant bow, like the FIFA draw. And the ambassador from a country, name for me a very obscure country. Cork. Cork. Right? <laughs> Terribly obscure country, not legally based in anything, by the way. More obscure than that. Well, give me a name of an obscure country. Swaziland. Perfect example. The Swaziland ambassador has to walk down and rustles the paper up and holds it up, and it just says, shite at small talk. <laughs> and then for the next five years, every time you hear about Swaziland, you go, oh, jeez, a shite at small talk. The Swaziland can't do it at all. I met a lad from Swaziland. I said, how is your wife? He said, she's very dry. 
me she's a very dry sense of humour. That's not what I mean at all. <laughs> but I'm shite at small talk. <laughs> and you can just make this stuff up, for God's sake. Like, another obscure country. <laughs> Angola, perfect example. Who among us truly knows about the Angolans? Who among us has studied, has lived, has travelled? Who among us has seen from the passenger seat of a jet plane what the people of Angola are truly like? One man. One man knows what the Angolans... I'm working up to you, by the way, here. It's got you. <laughs> He could describe for us in a couple of words the characteristic, the not physical, personality traits, come up with a couple of ones now, that perfectly sum up the Angolans. Scott, in your wide-ranging RAF-based <laughs> knowledge, the Angolans are... Angry. Angry and... Violent. Vo- angry and violent. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a huge, broad spectrum of personality. <laughs> Luckily, they combine their anger with a bit of violence, so it all works out well for them. Let's try one more. What did you say? Oh, Vanu- Vanuatu. Very good. You're loving that, aren't you? You're very happy to shout out Vanuatu. The people of Vanuatu are... Vacuous. Vacuous? Good answer. I like the way you're thinking here, right? <laughs> Vacuous and... Unknown. Unknown. <laughs> the people of Vanuatu are vacuous and unknown. <laughs> surprised they've remained so unknown, given that when you finally get to know them, there's nothing there. <laughs> you should see them stuck in a lift with the Angolans. Oh, the Angolans are kicking off in a huge way. But the Vanuatu people have no opinion to offer in the situation. I know, it's slow, but is it? I don't know. I didn't to say about the whole thing. And you're kind of wondering, Dar, what's the point of this? The point of this is, in a week's time, there will be a news report where they say, and there is a situation brewing at the moment in Vanuatu, and you're going to go, oh, those vacuous pricks. <laughs> so, of course, there's a situation there. Should sure, nobody knows anything about them. Should sure, they keep themselves to themselves so much? Do you know what they should send in the feckin' Angolans? They'll sort them out. <laughs> They'll rip through them like a dose of salt, the Angolans. They're livid. Livid about anything. Whatever. They're just tags, these things. They're random tags. They mean nothing. It's like, in a way, you know, the, the whole Billy Elliot thing, again, like, the reason I backed down so fast on that, like, whatever, was because I received one letter of support, right, uh, that says, to whom it concerns, we, the undersigned, are a group of concerned citizens living in a border region of Northern Ireland. We are writing to express our support for Mr O'Brien with regard to his comments on the link between paedophilia and homosexuality. <laughs> My comments on the link. I made a joke about Elton John. I didn't stop a show and go, hang on, wait a minute. Gays and our kids. Who's keeping an eye on that? That's all I said. <laughs> no doubt he is being targeted at the moment by the international gay mafia. <laughs> what a fantastically brilliant paranoid phrase that is. I wanted to write off and go, Jesus, who are they? I think Graham Norton might be one of them, but I can't imagine who the others are. My favourite phrase, we would like to express our full support for his stance against the forces of sodomy. (laughs) If you ever use the phrase, forces of sodomy, (laughs) it better be a gay heavy metal band that you're talking about. (laughs) Yours sincerely, Robert Mugabe. But these, it's, like, it's like the randomness of these national tags, or indeed of, the, of, of, of tagging the gay people, and all that stuff. The sheer randomness of that, it's a bit like the ID card, and it, it sums you up in a couple of phrases, which it doesn't. No ID card truly contains the information that makes you unique. For me, it's the stuff that you love, or you hate, you loathe, you're excited about. That's the stuff that defines you. I mean, I have no ID card, passport, driver's license, that will say that, for example, I'm a night person, right? I don't do daylight, I don't trust daylight, I don't like it. Many of you are day people, you're fine with it. Grand. If you're a day person, nighttime leaves you alone. But if you're a night person, daylight has no such qualms. Daylight will climb underneath the curtains, bounce off the carpet, off the ceiling, off the carpet, off the ceiling, into your feckin' eyes and wake you up. <laughs> people who invite you into their house and expect you to take off your shoes. <laughs> oh, I can't stand that. Here's a bottle of wine. Oh, thank you for coming along. In this house, we take off our shoes. Oh, do you? In this house, I leave mine on. (laughs) I'm not a mechanic. I don't work with livestock. I'm not going to trawl manure across your new carpet. I'm not going to step away from the dinner party, open a vein, and write my name in blood. (laughs) All the way on your floor. It's going very well. Enjoy your dessert. It's a lovely dinner. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Just thought I'd leave me mark. Uh, 
Do you know I call an ambulance? I'm getting faint at this stage. Yes. <laughs> Versus the things you love. For example, I love silence. I adore silence. And not kind of the, you know, the Zen Buddhist, you know, contemplative, desiderata, go placidly amidst the noise and haste silence. Not that stuff. The awkward silence between you and a stranger in a confined space. <laughs> you know when you're in a lift with somebody you don't know and somebody has to say something? It's like a game of staring where you let the tension build and build and build and build and build and then eventually they go, ah, here we are, and you go, fine, I win, get out the fucking lift, I win. Right? <laughs> My favourite is when somebody in the lift arrives and they go, thanks very much, and you're going, why are you thanking me? The lift did all the work. I'm just standing here, I didn't operate a pulley system behind your back. <laughs> Lifts are tremendous locations for social convention. Next time you walk into a lift and there are strangers there, don't walk into your normal place. Walk in, let the doors close behind you, and stand, staring into the lift. <laughs> they have no idea what to do in that situation. They're sitting there going, Jesus, what the hell is he doing? He's staring! Is he still looking? He's still looking at us! What is he doing? My favourite thing I ever did in a lift, I was in a lift once, on my own, and I had a bar along here, a bar there, and a bar there. I don't know if other men do this, right? If I'm in a situation where there's a railing about yay high, <laughs> I'll automatically start lifting myself up off the ground. <laughs> just for a second, I'm a Russian gymnast in the Olympics. <laughs> and they're going, look at the power, incredible, and then the legs come over, and boom! Well, the it's amazing what he's doing here. I was lost in this little reverie when the lift arrived. So I dismounted to get the full marks. Just spring out of the corner, ping, ha-ha, I got Just to get the full 10.0. So there's a woman with a child waiting, and all she hears is ding, and the door is open. And she just sees me going, oi! And she goes, oh my God. And I walked out and went, Jesus, that lift comes down fast. These are the things that define you. Your random loves and hates and dislikes. They define you as an individual, of course, and then you meet someone, you fall in love, and you've got to take her, your dislikes and her dislikes and loves and hates and slam them together and create your own mythology within the couple, which I love as a process. You meet couples, they have their own jokes, they have their own little language, they have their own story of how they got together, which is always some fantastically idealised version of the real events, some sort of, oh, when we met our eyes across the room, it was perfect, it was wonderful. Never. We were trashed. He <laughs> smashed out of our boxes. And I'd recently been dumped by somebody I truly loved. <laughs> so I wanted to put a bit of a distance. So anyway, we had the shag in the car park and then boom. Oh, it's all gone wrong since then. Right. <laughs> Never that. And all of the stages of life, again with the rules, again with the rules and the conventions. Like I've loads of friends, for example, who are having kids at the moment. I don't have any kids myself. Love that moment where you all go, uh, uh, <laughs> I could if I wanted. It's all in perfect working order. I just haven't got round to doing it. Thank you very much. I, I know how it works. I was given a ladybird book as a child, <laughs> which was quite specific about it. It had a little phrase I still remember to this day. When a man and a woman are married and in love and wish to have a child, they hug in a special way. <laughs> This is just sweet as a description. It does tend to paper over the whole handcuffs, who's your daddy element. <laughs> I don't think I come out of that mime very well. <laughs> For a start, what am I holding on to here exactly? <laughs> is she in a bridal of some description? <laughs> and all this left and right business, she's all over the place. She'd be in front of me going, Jesus, could you keep it in one axis, for Christ's sake? <laughs> Just forward and back will do fine. This left and right, you're all over. You're not getting any purchase at all, for Jesus' sake. <laughs> no. All my friends are having kids at the moment, and it's fine and great, but they're under one great delusion, which I presume all generations of parents do, which is they are going to be cool parents because they've done everything. They've travelled and they've had the adventures and they've done the drinking and the drugs and the craziness. And when their kids come to them, how could they possibly rebel against them? It's one of the great lies of it all. There's no such thing, right? There's no new parenting that our generation uniquely will do, that in 20 years' time, my 15-year-old is going to walk in and go, I want a tattoo. And I go, no, do you? Oh, do you want a tattoo? Well, let's see what your mother has to say about that. We get that? <laughs> Mary, come in here for a second, would you? <laughs> a tattoo, is it? A tattoo, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. Mary, would you ever show us your arse there, would you? <laughs> the 
Is that your tattoo? Is, it, is that your Celtic cross that you're so excited about getting? Look at your mother's ass. Look at your mother's ass. That's what it ends up looking like. Oh, you don't want a tattoo anymore, do you not? Thank you very much, Mary. You can go back to what you were doing your very time. What do you want now, then? Oh, you want a piercing? I'll show you a piercing. My favourite of all those, though, are the engagement stories. Again, loads of my friends getting engaged at the moment, and there's a whole convention about that, about how you're supposed to do this, and the rules you're supposed to observe in some way about all this. Scott, are you, is that your lady beside you there? Are you married, engaged? Engaged. Engaged, OK, well, congratulations, good luck on the big day and all that. I wouldn't dream of asking you to spell the story. That would be embarrassing, I wouldn't do that, right? I will merely check how many of the rules you observed, right? <laughs> Did you, Scott? Did you ask the father's permission? No. Good man yourself. <laughs> did you have the ring when you proposed? Didn't technically propose. You didn't, you did, you didn't technically propose? You, oh, phoom, thank you. That's fantastic. Good man yourself. Oh, all the rules are gone with you. That's brilliant. Did she te technically propose, did she? I might have twisted the You twisted it. It's very, very good. Well, good for you. That's even better for God's sake. I like the way you went along with the questions for the first one or two of them. Well, no, I hadn't asked the father's permission. Yeah, what? I, hello, hello. I, I wonder if you mind if I was proposed to by your daughter. That's it. <laughs> I can't stand these little rules. There's three of them, right? Father, thing, the ring, and the beautiful location to do it in, right? Not a fan. You know yourselves. You're at work one day. A friend comes in and goes, oh, my God, we're engaged. And you go, oh, that's amazing. Wow. How did it happen? It was perfect. John hired the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and then he rented the original members of the village people <laughs> to spell out the message, Mary, will you marry me? It was what I always wanted. And the feckers who asked permission. If I'm ever the father of a daughter in 30 years' time and some gonk arrives into me, looking for permission. I'm going to set the fucker tasks. <laughs> He's going to be collecting a fleece by the end of the week. <laughs> you want my permission? It's the year 2035. She hasn't asked for my permission for anything in years. <laughs> she didn't ask for my permission when she became a whore. <laughs> Oh, did you not know about the whore thing? <laughs> Terribly sorry, I shouldn't have been the one to tell you. Oh, it was years ago, just to pay for the whole... <laughs> the best I've ever heard is a mate of mine called Jake, who had the permission, who had the ring, had booked a holiday in the Maldives. It was going to be immaculate. Went through Heathrow security, went through the little shutter thing, all fine. His bag goes through. He had an iPod charger in the bag. Some weird-looking box with cables coming out of it. The security woman says, sorry, sir, do you mind taking that out? He says, no problem at all. Opens a bag up, shows it to your one. Right? She goes, that's absolutely fine, sir. You can go ahead. And he's about to go when the security woman spots another small, mysterious black box in the bag and stops him and goes, sorry, sir, do you mind opening that up as well? And Jake panics because he's got the girlfriend beside him in the security thing, and he just goes, eh, do you mind if I don't? <laughs> Which is like the wrong thing to say in Heathrow security. And anyone goes, yes, sir, I, I do mind. Could you please open that box up? He says, ah, don't move me, please, I, I soon not, I soon not open the box, right? And the girlfriend's going, Jesus, Jake, open the box, what's the problem? He's going, oh, relax, <laughs> don't make me open the box, don't make me open the box, right? Which is not a good thing, because your one, the security woman, is now stamping on a panic button that she has underneath the desk. Sections of Heathrow are being shut off all around <laughs> Other security guards are arriving in and unsheathing weapons. They're going, sorry, sir, could you please assist the woman? Could you, could you open the box? He's going, ah, lads, relax. <laughs> He's going, yeah, go. please don't let me open the box. Okay. And she goes, sir, please open the box. And the girl goes, go, relax. Ah, just don't let me open the box. And eventually, everyone's going, everyone down, everyone down. Sir, open the box, open the box. <laughs> and Jake, in the middle of Heathrow security, had to reach into his bag, take out the box and turn and go, Mary, these three years have been the happiest years of my life. That's the fucking story. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the doctor. I'm not really going to say No, very good. Listen.
listen, whatever about getting a bit of applause and all that crack off you, frankly, frankly, the show would be nothing. It's just me ranting and roaring, lads. Nothing. Nothing at this stage. There are so many people we've met, so many things we've learnt, ladies and gentlemen, over the course of this gig. We have learnt that there is a man here whose brain can handle disciplines as disparate as the German people and the piano. <laughs> and even during those two polls can fit a bit of sociology and a tiny bit of history in as well. And he's so casual about it, fuck it, he doesn't even have to study tonight. That's how cool he is about it. Four massively important, life-defining examinations ahead of him. What the fuck does he give a shite about it? Give it up, ladies and gentlemen, for James! Get over there! Do you have among you a man so mired in the shit of life, in the worst job you could possibly imagine, but still proud, still willing to stand up and admit to it in front of a crowd of thousands of people who would brick him, who would stone him, who would take him apart limb by limb for all the unnecessary bending down and going, the fuck, I don't want that, uh, <laughs> that they have to do during their lives. Give Simon a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to enjoy that here. All of which... All of which is, frankly, preamble. <laughs> because one man stood above all other men in this show tonight. One man who came from inauspicious beginnings, sucking his thumb and wailing, going, where has my mother left me? Why am I outside this place? Breeze Norton, what am I doing here? <laughs> Luckily, the Breeze Norton Musical Review happened to be arriving back from a gig they were doing at a festival of music in Biggins Hill. I run out of RAF stations very fast here, by the way. <laughs> and they saw this child, this small, brave child, huddled up in the reeds, and they said, we shall tend to him. We shall rear him as one of our own, and then we shall teach him to drive. <laughs> and we shall teach him to drive like no man has ever been taught to drive. He will not need to know of blind spots. He will not need to know of indicators. For he can turn and crush anything that happens to be on the outside of him. And then he shall be in charge of emergency services. Not directly. But he has stridden away from that, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sure, maybe he hadn't the balls to ask the beautiful lady beside him and had to be fucking nagged into doing it. But you did eventually, my friend. You are the hero among us. You fly where the rest of us, as they sing in the Breeze Norton musical review, fly me to the moon. And then they go, 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 oh, yes, at the end. <laughs> that is Scott, ladies and gentlemen, and he has been a hero. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen, Scott! I forgot to mention one man, stupid of me, like whatever. John, you're here, aren't you, John? How are you, John? Good to see you there, like whatever. John, good. Uh, John, uh, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a carpenter. You're a carpenter? Okay, yes. very good. Very, very noble trade and all that, like whatever. Are you, are you living in London now? Um, no, I've just currently moved to France. You've moved to France? Okay, great. We're all going, why is that? John, do you, have, do you have any claim to fame whatsoever? Um, I used to be the Milky Bar kid. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. The Milky Bar Kid from 1974 to 1978. So that you, you will be able to say, yes, I too have met a Milky Bar Kid. <laughs> that is genuinely from 1974 to 1978. Uh, as a matter of interest, do you have a superpower of taste? <laughs> can you turn people um, to chocolate if the mood strikes you at any given time? No, I'm afraid I can't, no. John, we can only finish in one way at this stage. I'm feeling a tiny bit peckish, and my guns are ready to fire. <laughs> what I need now is one man to say magical words. What are they? The milky bars are on me. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, John, for dropping it. A pleasure to have you here. To all of you, it has been a joy. Thank you very much. Good night, good night. Good luck to you again. Just for the crack, right? Mainly because, you know, at this point of the gig, you didn't ask for an encore, but there's always a load of people just doing this at the edge of each row. <laughs> just for the crack, as a gift to the two of you, right? As the start of it all, like, I, I don't know how, you know, did, did he woo you or did you woo him in the heel of the hunt? 
he wooed me. He wooed you. It was a wonderful thing. Good man yourself, Scott. Well done. I don't know what he said, what words he said. All men have a different kind of technique for luring the ladies in, right? And what magic words they say just to create the mood. I uh, always use one word. I always used to go, so. <laughs> just at the right moment, it raises the temperature just a tiny bit, right? So that they, if, and if she goes, well, you go, well, hey, and you're in, right? <laughs> And she goes, fuck off. You go, fuck off yourself. I wasn't even talking to you. <laughs> it's an immaculate technique. <laughs> but all men use exactly the same words when it comes to breaking up, right? I'm just giving the warning to all the ladies here, but I'll channel it through yourself. What's your name, by the way? Joe. Joe, okay. All guys have the same technique when it comes to breaking up with somebody. One word that they use in that situation, right? Watch out for this, Joe. Scott ever comes back from a difficult day at work and goes, listen, <laughs> it's over, <laughs> it's finished. Your job is to get out of there with your head held high. You have to be the winner in that situation. If he ever goes, listen, you immediately go, I fucked your brother. <laughs> See, you're out of there, and you're and like, now this is Scott is on the back, but he's going, whoa! Particularly good if he doesn't have a brother. He works twice as well in that situation. He goes, well, I have no brother. And you go, yes, you do. He tracked you down for many years. And he came here today, and I fucked him. <laughs> and then you're out the door. <laughs> but the thing is, I may not, you know, give, set this in context. I've given that advice before, but I haven't really given enough conditions. I don't mean, Joe, any time he says the word listen. <laughs> I don't mean, like, you're walking along a beach in the Seychelles and, and, and he cups your beautiful face and goes, do you know what sound I love more than any sound in nature? The sound of the waves lapping against a tropical beach. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> well, if ever lying in a spoon's position, Snuggle deeply, and you're all snuggle, 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 like that, like whatever. It's three in the morning under the duvet, and you feel terribly safe and warm and wonderful. And suddenly, Scott sits bolt upright in the bed. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> That'll be a bad time. <laughs> suddenly, you go. I fucked your brother. He's <laughs> like to go, that's very interesting, but there's an axe murderer climbing in the window downstairs. <laughs> Frankly, unless you fucked him as well, I should prioritise. <laughs> we'll see you again, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, goodbye, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to Simon, thanks to Jane, thanks to Chris, thanks to Scott, thanks to Mark, thanks to Dan. Good night, folks. See you again.
ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Theatre Royal. Please put your hands together and welcome on stage, Dara O'Brien. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Are you in good form? Yes, yes, it's great to have you here. Yes, I do do my own announcements. <laughs> it's a massive operation I'm running here, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see. Really is huge. And yes, especially for tonight, we have brought out a large polka dot bright light sheet just to flush out any latent epileptics in the room. <laughs> We're talking to people in the audience. Hello, how are you? We're clearly talking to you fuckers at the front. Good to have you here. 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 You have to do that. It defines the gig, ladies and gentlemen. Some of the ones on the tour this year already have been slightly bizarre. Uh, it was in Derry, right? Fantastic part of the world. There was a guy in the front row looking very imposing. I said, hey, what's your name? And the man goes, it's Paddy. I said, really? Is it Paddy? And what do you do, Paddy? I'm a priest. He said, now, the thing is, I've said this before, right? I'm not a religious man, right? I don't even believe in God, but still Catholic, obviously. <laughs> and you can't not keep going, ha, Father, is that all right? Are you enjoying it so far? How's that? Good man yourself. And go back. Because there's a place called St. Columns Hall in Derry as well, which is like an old temperance hall. And now, once I said, Jesus, Father, I hope you don't mind what I'm doing with the hall. And he says, don't worry, I'll exorcise it later. <laughs> which I thought was sweet from, but he said it in a really dense Derry accent, which means what he actually says was, don't worry, I'll exorcise it later. And I said, what? You exercise in glitter? <laughs> and the priest goes, no, I exercise in glitter. And I went, yeah, you exercise. And I couldn't get the image out of my head of the priest just sprinkling himself and then stretching. And, then just, and the light dancing off the calves as it went through all the things. It was a wonderful thing. It's fantastic. So that's the second level we're talking at, ladies and gentlemen. We're looking for ridiculous things. When I eventually randomly pick you, how are you, sir, at the end of the row? What's your name, champ? Dan. Dan, how are you, Dan? Are you local? I am, yeah, London. You're a Londoner. Like, what part of London? Vo Vauxhall. North of Vauxhall? Vauxhall. Oh, Vauxhall. Sorry, North of Vauxhall is the river, isn't it? For fuck's sake, uh, a ridiculous answer, Dan. But you never give that answer. You give a perfectly reasonable answer, and there we are mocking you for what I misheard. Oh, it's cruel, Dan, isn't it? It's vicious. And what do you do, Dan, in Vauxhall? I'm a technician. You're a technician? Indeed. That's fantastic. Doesn't narrow it down in any way, does it? <laughs> that really keeps it open for any possible industry in the world. Now, in which world are you a technician? In the planning world. In the planning world? Oh, you, build ha you don't even build the houses, you kind of go, that'll fucking fall down. That's <laughs> that was, uh, Jesus, look at it, on an angle. Who the fuck builds on an angle? I haven't been a technician for the last 12 years to know that you don't build a house. Slopey, slopey. Doesn't fucking work. <laughs> so what kinds of plans do you do? Like whatever, it's a big building, small buildings, uh, tall buildings, schools, it's, uh, hospitals. It's controversial, it's lots of buildings. It's controversial and lots of buildings. Is it really controversial? Will it split the room? That's what I want from a controversial <laughs> I want at some stage, Dan, when you tell us what kind of buildings you do, to have half the room up in arms going, for fuck's sake, Dan, I'm living about it. It's the fucker. It's, who is, who? it's the guy who did the fucking controversial building. Wait, let's fucking get him. I want half the room. The other people around defending you, physically holding back that side of the room as they lay into you with sticks and bricks. And you've said controversial. That pitches it at a relatively fucking high level of excitement here. Right? It's going to be amazing when you say this. Try to hold on to your good sense here, ladies and gentlemen. No ripping up the chairs and fucking them down to the top of the hall. Because I know you do that. The minute you hear what this guy builds, you're going to go, Jesus, not that guy. Not that monster of a man. <laughs> have I hyped it up a bit too much, have I? <laughs> it, it's not really that controversial, is it? Is it even a little bit controversial? What is it? It's in the, in the green belt. It's in the green... Oh, you build in green belts? You monster. <laughs> you build on green belts and you laugh in children's faces as they stuff their knees on concrete and go, ha there used to be a field here, but look at that, we built houses, houses and everything. <laughs> Let's not try to do work for God's sake. Let's not bore ourselves talking with you about working this day. What's the most exciting thing you've ever done? Maddest thing you've ever done? Ooh. By all means, take a couple of seconds to think of it. Right? <laughs> I wouldn't like you to think that I'm on a bit of a fucking clock here, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'll give you an example of some of the ones I've had over the course of the tour. A bloke in Cheltenham called Brian. What's the greatest thing you've ever done? I fell down a manhole. <laughs> a man in Leeds said, what's the greatest thing you've ever done? I was handed an amputated leg. <laughs> what's the greatest thing you've ever done? Anything mad or amazing you've ever done, Dan? Oh, not necessarily mad or amazing. When I met my girlfriend, it was a great thing. It was a great thing to meet your girlfriend. It certainly was. I've no doubt it was. It's a wonderful thing. It's good to have her here tonight as well. How are you, Pat? Is the girlfriend still with you? 
she is. Yes. Jeez, but she wasn't worth buying a fucking ticket for this show, was she? <laughs> but he said your pal is here instead. He bought the ticket. He bought the ticket. But he didn't like your girlfriend enough to buy her one as well. <laughs> Dad, what do you do? Dad, let's pick a number between one and ten, Dad. Just for the crack. One and ten. Five. You're going to go for five? One, two, three, four, five. How are you, Chan? How are you? True, isn't it? It's the fickle finger of fate that <laughs> picked you out, my friend. What's your name, Chan? Scott. Scott? How are you, Scott? And where are you from? Stevenage. But what do you do down in Stevenage? Um, I work for the ambulance service. You work for the ambulance service? Really? This making you pretty fucking bulletproof from where I'm standing at the moment. Right? <laughs> there is frankly nothing I can say to this guy, right? <laughs> Unless he's a really bad job within the ambulance service. You are, you're out there going psh, 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 into the back of Oh, you don't do that at all? Oh, good, thank heavens. What do you do instead? <laughs> I work in an office. You work in an office? Yeah. Do you have like a big, like a map, like whatever, with ambulances and you push them on big poles? Do you do that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be fantastic? You have tiny little ambulances and a map, and you just move them from place to place. <laughs> it must be great. Do they ever give you a go in the ambulance, do they? There you go. <laughs> do you dream of that, do you? Do you, do you have a little hat that you wear at your desk at home with a light on the top? Like that, and then you run around with information. I'm just as important as the ambulances. If I didn't give you the information, it, the ambulances wouldn't get there. <laughs> You're not a million miles wrong. I'm not a million miles off, okay. That's a, that's a yes, isn't it? And what's the maddest thing that's ever happened to you? Um, when I was 15, I was in a Fergal Sharky video. You in a Fergal Sharky video? <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> this is part two of your media career. Congratulations. <laughs> you know that behind you, at seven rows behind you, a woman went... <laughs> <laughs> really excitedly. I can see you there, Pat. Oh, it's amazing. In a Fergal Sharky video, was it for a good heart? It's hard to find. No. Because uh, yeah. that is, frankly, the only one anyone knows to wear. <laughs> you do occasionally hear, like, like, less savvy stories. The joy of doing a gig in London, right, is that you all know the rules of an occasion. I ask you a question, you throw the answers out, we have a bit of crack, life is good, right? There are certain parts of the country where they don't know that, right? There's a Newport in Wales. Any Newport people here? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> See the civic pride coming through already? It's amazing, isn't it? How would you, in a word, describe Newport, my friend? Shite, okay. Uh, that's harsh, right? All I'll say is they clearly had never had a comic there because I would go, hey, what's your name? And the guy literally went, whoa, what the fuck are you doing? What's this? What's this? What's this? And he'd look at his wife and go, Jesus, it's like his eyes are falling around the room. Why is it? <laughs> nothing off the first guy, nothing off the second guy, went down the road to the next guy, ended up at the very end. There's somebody sitting right at the end where you are there and going, you, that guy there. And just the blankest canvas I could find. What's the greatest thing you've ever done? And your man goes, oh, God. <sighs> oh, uh, for ages. And the whole crowd are going, Jesus, come up with something. He's getting angry down there. <laughs> and your man just goes, well, uh, God, I was the Milky Bar kid. <laughs> and then looked to me in a real kind of, is that the kind of thing you were looking for? <laughs> and you're going, yeah, that'll do. Yeah. That's quite healthy as a thing to have. Like, a genuinely a Milky Bar. Has anyone here ever met a Milky Bar kid? <laughs> it is a weird thing because they are dotted around the place. I once asked in Edinburgh, hey, has anyone ever met a Milky Bar kid? And the woman in the back was, they're not real. Whereas there was a woman in Glasgow who said she'd been chatted up in a bar in Ibiza by a Milky Bar kid. <laughs> and you kind of go, well, how many other angles did he try before he went, I'm getting nowhere here, get out the gun belt, right? Uh, <laughs> and she didn't go for it, which is the bizarrest thing of all, right? Just randomly, Dan, your lady here beside you here, what's your name, Pat? Joe. Joe, Joe, uh, what, would you, if a man came up to you and said, I was a Milky Bar kid, would you? Would you go for it, would you? Would you? Tempted. You were tempted, of course you'd be tempted. Think of the chocolate, it'd be fantastic, right? Because <laughs> more perfectly, that think of being able to turn around midway during the sexual act and going, oh, the Milky Bar kid is on me. <laughs> it would be a unique once-in-a-lifetime experience to say a phrase that, frankly, you don't get to say enough of in your time. Right? Okay. Just to check, by the way, you do lose occasionally people on this because it isn't an international phenomenon, by the way. Certain countries have it, certain countries don't. Any Americans in the room tonight? Yeah. I'm going to say, what part of the States are you from? California. 
From California. Oh, sorry, you were right at the front there, is it? Is it yourself there with the red hair upside down? Yeah. Hello, how are you? From California. Yeah. You didn't have this when you grew up, right? No, not until tonight. I never no, heard not. It. Okay, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. In fact, it's bizarre to explain to an American because they go, I'm sorry, what? And you go, oh, it's a very simple idea, right? In the event of a Wild West conflict. <laughs> The surest path to peace is to send in an albino child with chocolate. <laughs> Nothing calms down a gunfight faster than a small kid going, here, have a bit of fucking chocolate. Ah, I'm looking like, oh, I will, go on, come on, Wild Bill, we'll have a bit of chocolate, this is mad. Right? Not to be mistaken with the milk tray man, different guy entirely. You do not want to send the wrong actor to the wrong ad. I have a woman in a negligee walking into a hotel bedroom. Dan, da, 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 da. And there's a small blonde child in a gun bed. <laughs> Just stand there going, I'm about to be dipped. <laughs> but I kept in touch with my Milky Bar kid because I wanted to. I don't even know your man's name. He's only phone under M for Milky Bar kid, right? <laughs> That's the perfect place to have them, right? I wanted to reunite with all the other Milky Bar kids and create some sort of crime-fighting team of different ages of Milky Bar kids. But it made no sense, because they, see, they never had a superpower. That was the one problem with the Milky Bar kid. He never had any great power. And I used to ask audience to suggest what the obvious superpower that the Milky Bar what, like, super sense would he have, right? But bizarrely, we got the same answer every time I asked, right? So I'll just get you to get what audience is always constant. When I said, what super sense would you give the Milky Bar kid? They always said... Taste. taste. No, they never said taste. <laughs> crimes would you need a super sense of taste to solve? Every episode would have to be set in like a chocolate hammer museum of some description. Oh my god, the curator has been beaten to death. Which of the hammers did it? I know, let's call for the Milky Bar Kid. It was a 70% cocoa one. Thank you very much, Milky Bar Kid. You're a genius. No, it wasn't taste. What was it? Something what? Turn people into chocolate. Turn people into chocolate. <laughs> no, no, again, that, that's a first, uh, I have to say. <laughs> that is the bizarre thing, especially in a hot climate, you'd be affected at that stage. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a bad day for you, Mr. Villain. Poof! <laughs> and Mr. Sun shall finish the job. No, it wasn't that. It was X ray vision, is what most audiences said. But not tonight, you've gone a bit freaky. Uh, for some reason. <laughs> Or oh, the one night I said to somebody, what super sense would you give me? And your man said, a sense of decorum. <laughs> Which you just don't get enough of in superheroes when they're you know, Like arriving at a crime scene, there's a body and blood and guts everywhere. And you go, oh my God, what are we going to do? And he would come in and go, we shall give the family time to grieve. Back away. <laughs> Back away. The one I particularly got is the reason I, I loved your man, though, Milky Bar Kid, 1968, because uh, I said to him, did you get to say the magic words? And your man goes, no. No, I didn't. They dubbed me out. Because <laughs> in 1968, you people weren't ready for a Welsh Milky Bar Kid. <laughs> You'd have found that crazy and ethnic and a bit strange, wouldn't you? You'd going, what? I'm not eating that freaky chocolate from the valleys. The Milky Bars are on me. <laughs> so anyway, that's the kind of level we're talking about. My friend, what's your name, sir? James. Oh, God, somebody else jumped in there at this stage. Simon and Jake, Jason? James. James, are you a local, sir, are you? Yeah, I'm from North London. From North London, and James, what do you do? You're a young man, you're a student, are you a college? Student. Of? Uh, German sociology, history and music. German sociology, history and music. It's a natural Venn diagram, isn't it? <laughs> you can see the intersect. Are you an A-level student? Is that what you are? Oh, God, you're only a child. Look at you. You're a cherub, for Christ's sake. And what a natural collection of A-levels that is. It should have... Employers will be screaming for you. <laughs> Crying out for... We've got a hole in our company the size of a man who knows German sociology, history, but can he play the guitar? <laughs> I know one such man. One such man who does timpani as well as German sociology and history. It's a unique set of talents, my friend, and there's one job out waiting for you in the Goethe Institute band. <laughs> when are the exams? A couple of months' time? A uh, couple of 
weeks, actually. A couple of weeks, excuse me, sorry. So good that you're taking a night off from the study at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> what did you schedule for here before you decided to just like, piss it all up to a tree and come out and just see a comedy gig instead? Doing essays today. Oh, you're doing essays today. Well, there's a welcome break for it. Like, just so you know, by the way, from the rest of us here who've been through the whole school system and that, and have gone to on the other side of the education and all the exams and all that, the stuff you're learning day to day, the, all the subjects and all the quotes and all of that stuff, like whatever, that stuff, when you get out into the real world and you're looking for work and you're meeting people, and all, that stuff is vital. <laughs> Frankly, Hardly a day goes by <laughs> that I don't have to quote a theorem or mention a poem. I was in a nightclub the other night and a woman came up and said, what's the biggest of the Great Lakes? And I went, uh, is it Lake Michigan? And she said, close enough, I will go to bed with you. <laughs> Whereas Simon, Simon, what do you do? Um, I work in IT. You work in IT? It's exciting stuff, isn't it, Simon? Who do you do IT for? Direct mailing. For a direct mailing company? <laughs> That's fucking controversial. <laughs> you, nothing on that. You just sashayed in and whipped the rug from underneath it. <laughs> Who wants this stuff coming in the door? Nobody, but I still send it. Ha, 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 ha. You do that around the office, do you? Send more stuff to Henley. Ha, 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 ha. Now we shall blitz North London. Ha, 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 ha. You have a big map and like a loads of... And you push the direct mail around, indicating where you're going to bring all of your evil direct mail. Ha, 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 ha. Finest piece of direct mail I ever received, which is from an estate agent in my area, because they're constantly putting stuff through the door saying, we have disappointed customers who can't find a house in your area. What a fucking guilt trip that was. Oh, no! We should move out. <laughs> These people are disappointed. <laughs> anyway, what age are you, my friend? 17, 18? Uh, I'm 17 in three weeks. You're 17, so you're 16 is the actual answer to that question. <laughs> no amount of I'm 17 in three weeks. I saw through the logic of that one. It's a clever little ruse you've got. <laughs> You're 16, my friend. My God, good to have you here. You're having a bit of a drink while you're here. Go on, too, because you look slightly older. You'll get away with it. <laughs> We'll get somebody to do it. Like, get, get, get Simon, because he works with direct mail. He has no morals anyway. He'll go up and buy you. You stuff you full of drink. Can you drive, by the way, if you're when you can drive? Thank you.